let's go ahead and call the meeting to order at six. <laughs> well, depending on which time you're talking about. <laughs> I go by the time on my computer, so it's 6.32. Okay, well, I typically go by the clock, but okay, fine, 6.32. Thanks for answering. Um, are there any select board issues or concerns? I would like to add just a little discussion about the economic development coordinator. Economic developer as an agenda item. Okay. Any other new agenda items? I have a couple. Okay, go ahead. So I I think that we owe Frank and Giselle Eldred um, some sort of response. I have responded. Uh, okay. Um, are you going to bring the board up to speed on what that was? Sure, I can. Yep. Okay. Um, Depending on what that response is, I may have some additional comments. But, um, I note that at the bottom of the agenda, there is an executive session um, if needed. Is that sufficient in your mind to uh, make a motion at that time to go into an executive session? Um, that executive session is specifically around a tax appeal. Yeah, but there's another one at the very bottom executive section. If oh, needed. I needed. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, I think that is sufficient for an additional executive session, but we will want to go into an additional executive session. That would be my yep. motion okay. at the time, if needed. Um, there have been various letters um, which have been received regarding ATD signs. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I think again. I think those deserve some sort of response, and you know, who should do that? Yep. Okay. Um, and I guess the final thing would be, um, I think we owe the historical society a response with <clears throat> regard to their initial proposal, um, sort of the financial spreadsheet piece that was handed out at the last meeting. We have a, we'll push off the additional historical society for next meeting. Um, yes. That, that's fine, as long as it, yep. as long as we don't lose track of it. It's on the list for next meeting, yep. And then the only other thing I had a question about is um, in Brian's report, he's got uh, as item number six, review and selection of auditing services. <clears throat> I was wondering if we should move that up on the agenda so that Rosemary is here when we discuss that piece. I'm wondering if we should move that to Rosemary, are you staying the Treasurer's report? Yeah. Rosemary's usually here. She usually takes out. Stay, stay for that. Okay. Well provided it's not 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make any guarantees. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, the yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay. Sorry. Cool. Any other additions to agenda? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the ATV signs, I think we should bring up in the issue, it's like board issues and concerns. So let's jump right into that real quick, if you don't mind. Um, Duncan, do you want to kick us off on that? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Um, ATV signs? Yeah, so we just, you know, we've, I think everybody's seen the various emails that we've received. I think all of the board members received those about, there was one from Jen Barton, there was one from um, Evan forwarded from um, uh, um, Jan Gearhart. Jan Gearhart. Um, That's one from Jackie Stan. There was one from Jackie Stan. I, I, I think those, should be responded to by somebody. And I don't care who does it. I just think they deserve a response. I would agree. Um, Fair enough. I have since, I think Brian and I also received them from Jen Burton as well. So I don't think did. I don't think. I did. I did. I did. Yeah. I didn't receive an additional email from Jen. Yeah, uh, maybe I'm confusing it then. I thought it was just okay. I thought it was a limited group. Okay. Right. Um, I'm happy to respond to them. Uh, you know, uh, I think what's appropriate is to ask our, uh, our road foreman and our, and our public works group to 
as they're going around the town, make a more serious inventory of the signs that the ATV club has put up and make sure that the signs are in compliance with our ordinance. That they, I don't know that we've received a complete catalog of uh, all signs that are out of compliance, but you know, fix the ones that we know are out of compliance and keep an eye on are there others that, you know, that aren't uh, posted properly. And just a, a comment in, in regard to that, Brian. Um, I think the picture that Jen sent was a, a diamond on, it looked like it was on an electric utility pole. Um, it is actually uh, a violation of state law to tack anything to a utility pole. Not that we necessarily have to deal with that, but um, it's it really shouldn't be on a utility pole. But we'll fix the ones that we've been alerted to uh, and keep an eye out for others. And I'll respond to that effect, those folks that have sent us information about the incorrect signs. We have to have some clues putting them up. I believe that most of them have been put up by the ATP club. Uh, um, in general, we've cooperated with the ATP club. About putting signs up. Uh, it sounds like they have. Uh, we might need to reevaluate the policy. It sounds like they, they or that practice. Uh, it sounds like, and it appears that there's been a number of uh, signs that are incorrectly posted. Okay. It would seem to me we would want to tell them. Somewhere or another, when we're taking their signs down, so they just don't look at them all back up. Yeah, no, we'll be in touch with the ATV club, but also they are, they belong to the ATV club, so we'll be returning their signs. Okay. Yeah. Very generous. The state does do that. I know. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Duncan, for bringing that up. Um, okay, invoicing, invoice and order review. Yeah, okay, cool. Perfect. Right. Sorry, I have a copy of that. Will you read it, Evan? Uh, 3M Promotions, what, what website Sorry, management? Uh, Anne Hennett, Hennard. Uh, beautification mini grant, two hundred dollars. That's the maximum. Russell Fuels uh, assortment of deliveries to the town garage, town diesel tanks, uh, totaling two thousand nine hundred sixty seventy two dollars and sixty four cents. Uh, what do we have here? Cartographic Associates, CAI mm -hmm. Technologies. Yeah. For $2,022, Country Home Center, uh, Curlic Sheet, $249.99, County Oil, Plumbing and Heating, Cold Storage Building, uh, 405.67, that was split half and half with the village, Dean Lock, uh, Nuisance Animal Removal, $150. Fisher Auto Parts, uh, Hydro Cedar, O-Ring, Hose, O ring armor all $203.34 is the total of that. Can you just pause for one second? Brian, do you know what the nuisance animal is? Jacqueline's in that cold storage building. Oh, really? Again? Again. <laughs> wow, those are. <laughs> they're they're, they're smart. displaced. I know. Um, I have a question on the. CIA technologies, just because I know Brian's going to bring up a topic on this later. Um, does this, do these two invoices fall into that discussion at all for later? Uh, Rosemary, correct me if I'm wrong, but those, the two that are here are not the ones that we discussed right. today. And they're not related to that. Are they related to that line item in the budget? 
Uh, they would be related to that line item because we don't really do much else with CAI. Yeah, okay. But uh, they are not part of the, uh, the maintenance work that they've done that we'll, we'll discuss in a few minutes. Okay, perfect. So more to come on that topic, but you know, yeah. just keep in mind that. Okay, thanks for letting us ask questions. Front porch forum. There was a donation for two hundred dollars. Uh, G and E extinguishers LLC. Uh, there was work at the food shelf and highway department and municipal building, totaling three hundred and eighty nine fifty. Uh, Han welding supply for supplies and cylinder lease for fifty seven sixty eight. There is a Johnson Hardware and Rental, seed and hay, as well as mulch. Uh, Can I interject with a quick question? Certainly. One that's not highlighted, the Jewett. Um, are, will, at the end of this fiscal year, will that end our payments to Jim Jewett for the, for the property? April of next year. April of next year. So we still basically have a year. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, I think we. I'll just go with the Johnson Hardware and Rental hay and seed and mulch for one hundred ninety five twenty five. Memorial County Little League uh, for nine hundred dollars. Uh, Staples Business Credit for supplies thirty nine eighty five. That's due to due to from the village was fourteen twenty three of that. Uh, Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher uh, for legal expenses, $1,690. Tech Group for tech services, um, totaling $1,346.50. It's not perfectly halfway split with the village, but the village is paying $772 of that. Oh, sorry, I went with the wrong line. There's a bunch more lines. There's tech services with what, two different invoices there, totaling $2,935.50. My apologies on that. Uh, Vermont Agency of Transportation uh, for the trailhead building of $200. What's that for? I'm guessing that's an application for the utility. Uh, the village for crossing the trail, trail one time application fee. What's the uh, amount again? 200. 200 bucks. 200. Yeah, that's what. Any other questions? Okay. Hearing no. Okay, thanks, Evan. Um, Review and approve of minutes from April 1st and 18th. Yeah, before we approve them, I've got a couple of suggested changes that people might want to think about before we make a motion, or do you want a motion and then? No, go ahead and go ahead and knock them up. Okay. Um, Don, I know it's really hard when people are wearing, wearing masks to not do so, but in, in your minutes, you've got Dick Seamays. It was actually Dean West. Oh yeah, some somebody pointed that out. I can't remember if it was. Yeah, oh. I think I had a discussion with Ben. Okay. Okay. And, um, and that was the April eighteenth meeting. meeting. What's that? That was the April eighteenth meeting. Uh, it was the yes. last one yeah. we had. Yeah. Um, and also, you had two other people from the historical society. Oh yeah, I didn't know who the people came in and set that. One of them was Tom Carney. I'm sorry, okay. And the other one who is not actually a member of the Historical Society was Donnie Garrett. Oh, okay. Oh, the guy who lived in the apartment. Yes. Does he spell the name Y or I? Uh, I believe he does I. Okay. And the Yeah, I mean, you could do Don or Donald. Um, and the other guy was Tom Carney. Okay. okay. Donnie Garrett with Garrett. Two, uh, two R's and two T's, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and <laughs> this is a minor thing, but I noted that Mark Woodward said we were going to get 10 million for our ARPA funds. I think you said that tongue in cheek, Mark, but I. I, I certainly. Oh, yeah. 
Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> My understanding was he was going to make up the difference. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that should be reflected so, in the middle. So we should yeah. get. <clears throat> <laughs> um, and then the only other thing, item 16, um, maybe should clarify that the noise ordinance, there were actually two separate noise ordinance waivers. One was for green up and one was for the skate park event. Uh -huh. There were two ordinances for the skate park. There were two Wait. waivers for the skate park. Um, yeah, the green up one was also at the skate park. Well, yeah, there were both. One was one was for green up day help, and one was for the skate park. Well, they were both applied for. Casey but, Romero applied for both of them. Yeah, and they're both hosted at the same location, so I guess. Uh, okay. I understand. I don't, I don't remember. Is it is the is the green up day event going to be hosted? At yeah, the skate that's park? what she said yeah. in her email. Uh, there is a green up day event at the skate park. At the skate park. Yeah. Okay. There is also green up day activities at the village green, like usual. But there is going to be a separate <clears throat> event at the skate park. That they're going to have live music in. Oh, okay. And so, both waivers okay. were skate park waivers. Uh, yes. I'm, I was confused that it, it, I no. thought it was for the Green Up Day. But... Yep. No, it's just happening on Green Up Day. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, um, Duncan, would you like to make a motion? I would move um, the minutes with those changes, except the ones related to the skate park. You have a motion. You have a second. Second. Oh, uh, any discussion? So, so the mark thing. I can't. I'm, I'm not looking at it now. Is it, that's just something I just totally like joke. I, I can't even remember what it was. It was uh, at the discussion of whether we would take the standard deduction for the ARPA funds, and Mark Mark did make the comment that's ten million, right? Um, I'm sure I did. But, <laughs> but, but I, think, I think the. Oh, oh, and I just was not thinking about it, and I just put that in the minutes. Yeah, it got put in the minutes as it's 10 million. Uh, right. and, and I suspect that was the project meeting on the fourth. Was that from the fourth? No, it was in the same minutes. It was in the same minutes. Yes, it was in the 18th. So, I mean, it could be, it could be just struck all together, yeah. or, or you could. You know, you could make it like a funny ha ha. Before it gets out into the public too far. Mark Wooten said. Okay, so we have a motion for the April 1st to April 18th minutes. <clears throat> Any additional discussion? Donna, are you all are you are you all set? I think so. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, ayes have it. Um, I'm wondering why we don't have April 4th on our list. Because we broke that the last week. We did it. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Rosemary, you're up. Okay, the only thing I have is the studio store, the gallery is having a event on May 13th, and they're going to be serving alcohol. Between the hours of 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. 5 and 7? Yes. The gallery opening now. Move to approve with no conditions. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Sorry, I was a little bit thinking and I should have been paying attention. Um, <laughs> any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, and the ayes have it. Uh, I'm going to hijack a little bit the uh, Rosemary report. Rosemary, you said you were done. Yeah. Uh, as Beth mentioned, uh, we did get some additional bills from CAI. Uh, CAI, CAI Technologies is our uh, companies and those are GIS mapping systems. So those maps you can go online and look up property, uh, look at the property cards and information about who owns it, what 
all the public information linked to a map. We've received a few bills from them recently for uh, the total made up to a pretty significant expense, about uh, ten thousand uh, dollars, which is considerably more than we normally pay them. And uh, the last few years, we have been paying them a little bit less than we had in the past. Uh, you know, that it, it appears that there was some maintenance work that was not happening. We weren't getting charged for it, but we're now getting charged for it all at once. Rosemary and I are going to be doing a little bit more investigation on uh, reviewing our contract with them and trying to tease out more details about why this uh, maintenance work wasn't done and how it was missed. And why we're being charged. Yeah. Yeah. I know are, are they back charging us for work? Yeah, but I don't think they're back charging us for work that was done. I think they are, from the, the description they gave me, they are now charging us for work that for some reason was not done in previous years. So they're doing the work now that they should have been doing over the years. Yes. And they're charging us for all at once. Yes. And they didn't communicate in any way, shape, or manner about that fact or that process? No. Just did it and build us? And we budgeted 2500 yeah. for the year because we budgeted based on the yeah, which does the cost for our web maintenance. Normal, for the normal web maintenance piece. Yeah. Yeah. Normal the process yeah. So your point is your point, Rosemary, that it actually was budgeted a little, we had more in the budget line, but it's for these, like these normal charges that we're used to. We used to have like $5,000 budgeted for tax mapping. I remember probably two or three years ago, and took all of our uh, new surveys up to the town of Morristown, and they have a white scanner. Mm -hmm. She scanned them all and sent them to them. What were what were new? Apparently, they didn't do any before. Mm -hmm. Until just recently, they came. Well, was it last summer when Terry's had just started? Remember? They've been. They came by then. Uh, Franco was here pretty recently too. Oh. Uh, they've met with Terry a couple times. Terry hasn't ordered anything. She hasn't made a couple requests about changing, you know, about getting the names to display properly and acreages and a couple other like minor changes that are well within what we would expect for regular budgets. I think like all of all told, Terry's requests are like four hundred dollars. So those are normal, and I approve those as. Kind of just regular process of this helps our assessor do her work better, you know, that's a reasonable expense. And then we receive additional charges uh, for some other maintenance. And at this stage, we don't know exactly, we're, we're going to be learning some more details, but you know, trying to bring the board up to speak on, on that. But yeah, with that, presumably there was something, some data that they weren't receiving. Uh, that they caught up on now. Uh, the staff that we had that was doing this before was is not here anymore. So I don't, it's a little hard to reconstruct. Yeah, so there's a lot of factors at play and we're not really sure. So you're going to get that. So you're looking into it and yeah. you're going to get back to us and what the two of you find. Is this the line item that you budgeted 2500 for? It is. Uh, I couldn't tell you what the line item is. It's, it's 160. It's called tax maps and related. That's it. So how are we uh, current year? And obviously we funded both the next year specifically. We can we can afford it with our projected surplus for the end of the year, but it is significantly over what we had expected. Rosemary, you had a line item that you suggested we were probably going to underspend. The we're going to underspend the uh, assessor's cost, but just about it, except the line about it. Worcester's contract and services. Yeah. No. I don't remember what so, the budget was for that. Was it 30000 I'm not worried. Like it, It's not 15. going to give us a... Uh, it's 15, Rosemary. I think it's still be understandable. 
I'm not worried about this in a, a running a deficit kind of level. It's just still a lot of money. We want to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Without My impression from this is that it's that it's built for current work, that it, it is work that for a reason that I don't understand was not done in previous years. So it's not that they're building us for work that they already completed in a prior fiscal year. But I'm with Mark. Yeah. I'm with Mark because if they're taking a whole bunch of backlog, because you're talking about a backlog, and if they're taking a big backlog and they just did a whole bunch of backlog work without telling us they were doing it to a small for a small town, relatively small town, um, you know, we can't be the only ones that, that would react this way. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. just really nearly cut the check. So uh, right. Yeah. If if nothing else, we should be able to split it between this fiscal year and next fiscal year. And and I would hope that they might be willing to allow us to spread it over. Since since it appears to be work that they did for prior years, that maybe they would allow us to. I think the thing that bothers me is they didn't, you know. A five minute phone call could have solved a lot of problems. Well, um, we could have said maybe no, we don't have the budget. Yeah. Yeah. And we could, you know, we could have said, well, you know, do it next year, do it the year after, <laughs> whatever. Um, we need we need time to react to it. Ooh, so, yeah, yeah. more information. Yep. And just another thing that's a little concerning this last month, you know, third. Uh, gravel overrun of 60,000, 68,000 for water. Uh, and this, everything's going in the wrong direction. So uh, we have to be conscious that we've only got two months left on this fiscal budget. And it does, yeah, to your point, it does affect our long term plan because we don't have money going into surplus, going into accounts that would go to our capital spend. Later for long term, long term cash flow. Yep. So we'll talk about this one again. Yes. Uh, but I think you understand the sentiment of the board. Did you have everything you wanted to add? Uh, I mean, he said he was that him and Rosemary were going to follow up and get more details. Okay. Okay. Right. Do you have other questions for the board, Brian? Thank you. Debt purchases, Brian? We have no plan purchases for uh, at this time. Uh, you have salt surplus in the admin report? I do. Is that different? Uh, the salt surplus is purchasing the salt related to finishing a contract that the board has already approved. Yep. So it is. The board has already issued its approvals for us to spend that allotment of money for that purchase purpose. Uh, so I don't think, I did not feel that we needed it in the, uh, to file it as an additional purchase, new purchase. Fair enough. It's the next item on our agenda item. Is there anything more you'd like to say about that? <laughs> so uh, let's get into that in detail. Um, so the, we're going to finish out the contract that we have with uh, uh, our, our salt supplier. We have a new salt supplier. It's, it doesn't matter where our salt supplier is. Uh, Compass Minerals, I think. But we have a, a salt contract that we established for this year for the purchase of 600 something tons of salt at a given rate. The price of salt are going up, the price of shipping are going up. Um, and we are in the very fortunate position of having not used our full allotment of salt in the previous year. We had a pretty good winter. We implemented some new technologies on our salt spreader, and we started using the brine application in our salt spreader. 
between those, we've significantly reduced how much salt we needed to use over, over this winter. Um, but we want to, we plan on uh, finishing out that purchase and making the additional purchase, or excuse me, not, not additional, but just finishing out that and having a surplus of salt in stock for next year. Do you know what the cost will be? The cost will be 18,000. It's about 18,000. Uh, parking charges, shipping charges vary a little bit, but it's about 18,000. Now, with that being the case, I, I guess we're still not running a deficit on our budget. But the salt shed needed repairs to keep the water out of it. And if we're going to keep $18,000 worth of material on hand, I don't want it to go anywhere. Yes. We will be completing some additional repairs on there. It is an open building. <laughs> I understand so there's some losses, lose but if we can mitigate what we can, absolutely, that would be, I would be a proponent for it. Yeah, we don't usually have this much in stock, so it's <clears> gonna be a little bit different for us. Uh, but yeah, working with the, uh, you know, having the surplus and maintaining it throughout the year is gonna be, uh, you know, pretty high importance to it. Yeah. And what does that look like for our budget as far as, are we just taking it out of other things we're proposing for reserve funds? No, it is coming well, out of the budgeted it's funds. It's not that amount. I meant the 68,000 we spent on material for mud season. The additional material for mud season right now, uh, I projected for the end of the year uh, to just come out of surplus. Yeah. That we were running a large amount of surplus right now that with the additional, uh, with our projected end of year that includes the additional uh, stone and gravel that we had to purchase for mud season and resupplying up our stock, uh, which we did before the price increase that took place on, I think it was May 1st, uh, or maybe in April, but we purchased a, a significant amount of additional supply for stock of gravel and sand. We use a lot of it, that total up to, like I said, about $68,000. Uh, that was taken care of between our budget items and uh, our surplus. At this time, we're still running a surplus with all of our projected expenses, including the salt purchase. And we still have the 100,000 money in the tax reserve fund because we're, we're held for that one. Yes. Okay. I'm just asking a question. No, absolutely. Uh, the, this, yeah, the, the, we're still running the projected surplus for the end of the year. So the projected surplus for the end of the year projection right now is 28,000. Yes. Um, but given that the AI discussion, it is more like, you know, 18 ish. Sad, weren't we at like 80 or something when we did the budget? So. Yeah, we're, we're certainly whittling away at that. Does, does that estimated amount include an amount to be applied to taxes in the, in the upcoming year? Or is that already taken out of this 28? I believe that it is. It wasn't when we run the 70. I don't have the whole spreadsheet in front of me. I believe that's all, that that is already accounted for. Do you agree with Rosemary? Yes. And any any other? I, I I wasn't present for the budget discussions, but did you guys allocate any any of the rest of the surplus potentially as items that would come out of the surplus funds and have those been? We had talked about putting it, uh, a slug of money in the equipment reserve fund and then another allotment in the reappraisal reserve fund. Well, tax anticipation, that's what I just asked the $100,000 question about. Because we're held to that. The rest of the reserve well, funds, we we're don't. We're held to the amount applied to reduce taxes. 
but I think we were going to put a little bit of money into the tax anticipation fund. These are oh, you're you're not talking about the stabilization. You're talking about the anticipation. Those are a few yeah. different items that we did. It, it was the, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe it was a little bit of money for the capital equipment fund for the, the public works department. The tax anticipation reserve fund. Which we had not been contributing to prior, correct? Uh, we've been contributing to it, but it's still low. Okay, okay. Uh, and the uh, reappraisal fund. And uh, uh, a lot meant to reduce taxes. Uh, most of the funds that we dedicate for that come from the surplus from the prior year. So they come from settled funds. Uh, but I believe that we're still in, in good shape for all of our projected reserves. But we do, uh, yeah, well, we do need to, when the year wraps up, we should look at our budget and talk about our reserve funds for the capital equipment because we had a low year and in our budgeting, we anticipated more going into that reserve than probably we'll be able to put into it. And we do need to look at the effect of that on our capital equipment plan. It's like four years out, it's about four years out. Yep. Well, and there's gonna be huge changes to that by the end of summer anyways. Yep. Uh, Hopefully. <laughs> well, depends on your hopefulness. Depends, yeah, cost, we don't know cost will be. Well, my point is we took out way more money for that greater yep. than we had budgeted for. And yep. if we don't get good money for the one that we had, numbers on that budget are going to change a lot because that's it's the good, most expensive yeah. piece by a large amount. So in you know, kind of in that context and sort of what you're saying, I I think it's perfectly legitimate for us to look at that, even though it was budgeted and there's a contract for it. I think it's perfectly legitimate for the board to look at that and make a decision as to whether or not we want to spend that additional $10,000 salt, or is it 15 for what? Salt. That's like 18. 18,000. Yeah, it's about 18,000. But spending that in our budgeted amount of money it's going to save the taxpayers of this town money yeah. in the long term <laughs> and we're only looking at two years two months to close out our end of fiscal year it could very well and it might i just if it if it negatively impacts our our other things like reserve funds that could cost us money too certainly could <laughs> so so I, my point is i'm not saying that i disagree with spending the money i'm saying that i think it's absolutely legitimate for us to have the discussion as to whether we should spend that eighteen thousand, and not simply say it's in the budget it's in a contract we're going to fill it i think we are filling the contract yeah i think we already did talk about yeah. that though we talked about it a couple of meetings ago and made the decision to go ahead with the salt purchase uh, so if we're going to, I mean, if we're going to keep talking about whether or not we're going to go with the salt purchase, I'm worried we're going to quickly run out of time, considering we're in May and our budget closes soon yep. and our contract. Well, I think if you read the minutes, what the, what the minutes reflected was that Brian would report back to us and take a look at the, I don't think we approved it. Uh, 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 take I, a look I, at the budget impact. I think, I think yeah. the, the, the direction of Brian was take a look at the overall budget, not just the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, was. and look at, the look at it in the context of the overall budget. That's my recollection. And I think that's what the minutes reflect. I believe that that's correct. And that's kind of what, what, what I'm giving you today. It's the overall budget still looks positive. Still looks you know, pretty healthy. Uh, so let's get a feel from the board. If we want to. Well, wait a second. Wait, wait. Let's not go down that path yet. Okay. Let's get a feel from the board. Do we want to hold off on salt purchase? Or do we want to have further discussion around salt purchase? Uh, Duncan? Well, if, if what Brian is saying is, is correct and we're good, I would say go ahead and. and 
as he pointed out, make the purchase. But. I'm fine with fulfilling the contract. I made my worries known about just the salt shed getting its repairs, and they're already working on it, so they're ahead of me on that. Okay. And Eric, maybe? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it would be good still to see uh, the latest, the latest forecast on the budget, so what the impact of purchasing the salt is, the 68,000 for gravel for mud season, uh, and then with the CAI of traditional mud. Yeah. And that doesn't change your, that doesn't change going ahead with the salt purchase. No, I guess I would still support it in the long run. I think it's safe. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm on board with the purchase. I think, I think it's a wise purchase. It certainly um, it'll save us more. It'll save us more. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It sounds like we have consensus, Brian. So, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead with it and I'll provide us with an update on how it's impact on our reserve. Yeah, I'm coming here. Uh, I think that, um, yeah, so an updated budget. So thank you for this updated budget. We'll just, I think we should just, we're toward the end of the year at this point. We should probably just get this regularly. Uh, right. um, so the full budget regularly, and then also what the impact will be through our reserve plans. Yep. Yeah, the, I didn't, I'll include that on, on the next one. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what my Twenty-eight thousand for what? Regis of low for a rainy day reserve. So I don't. That would be nice for me to know what we typically hold. Yep. Um. When you send it out, can you send an Excel file out? And I think giving you the file to look at and then talk about. I think you really good. Yeah. Yep. Um. It's yep. all very confusing because a lot of the reserves are based on cash assets. Okay. Yeah. And it's not really reserve, it's surplus. Yeah, surplus. Yeah. Oftentimes we have cash on hand that rolls over, and that seems to roll through. How year much was the year tax? Year year. How much was the uh, tax? We should do it. So we should do a special, like, every time we do the budget, focused discussion. And whether it's a board meeting or not, you know, it's a to everybody, I guess. Uh, but in the meantime, Brian, if you get the file together, we'll get it out. Mark, I'll connect with you on what that looks like um, and invite the rest of the board. If everyone wants to go through the budget together, then we'll incorporate it into a, either a regular board meeting or perhaps a special board meeting. Um, so it's going to go long, so we might want to have a focus on that. When do we, when do we create our budget? Uh, in the fall. In the fall. Late fall. Yes. But it's not a calendar year budget. Uh, no, it's a, the fiscal year is July 1st. Right. Okay. But we have to create the budget for town meeting. Town meeting. Town meeting. So it, it, it has to be completed by typically the last week of January. It might make a lot of sense for Mark and I, as new board members, to meet with Brian and not waste the rest of the board's time on sure. budget yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, up to you guys, and if you want to, if you want to go through the budget again, we can. But it yeah, might be I, more efficient. I don't know. Yeah, I can totally relate. I was in your seat literally last year. Um. Okay. So, okay, so much for five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you, Brian, for the salt. Go ahead with the purchase, and we'll get updates on budget. And I'll let you and Mark and Duncan work out. Um. Budget review. If anyone else wants to be in order, I'll I'll circulate that, about, and we'll make the decision of uh, whether we're meeting as a board or just a couple of individuals. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. Next up, planning for the input on the use of American Rescue Plan Act funds. So this is our our funds. We filed on time and requested the standard deduction. Uh, so we are receiving our whole allotment as a revenue uh, basis our general budget once we take possession of it and assign it to projects. There is still some additional reporting to do as time goes on, uh, but we're underway with that. Uh, the 
big component that we have not tackled yet is uh, working with the public uh, about kind of the best possible use of this fund. It's a recommendation uh, of the of the federal and, and state government uh, and the, the advice we have on this. Uh, we we have to figure out how we want to solicit that input. If we want to have a dedicated meeting to it, take a few times, take some time at a couple of our regular meetings, we could the suggestion box out in the lobby. Like we have a lot of different avenues that we could go for this. Um, if I could make a suggestion, if nobody has any strong opinions about it, I'd like to try and identify a couple of our kind of highest priority items that we think are most likely look through public meetings like this one, and then do something, some surveys to try and narrow that down to our best possible use. Um, you know, but I think that starting brainstorming in public sessions like meetings would be a, a good way to kind of set the stage for what our options are. What do you think, Jim? I, I, I wonder, we're gonna have to do a good job of selling it to get the public to a special meeting. I mean, no. you, you, I mean, I, I know time. about special <laughs> meetings and I know that people don't come to them, the people that are passionate about So, you know, I'm in favor of rolling them into a select board meeting personally. Okay. Can you, I didn't hear what you said, Mark. I'm just sort of, you know, a special public meeting to discuss ARPA funds. I don't think you'll get 10 people to come to it. Agreed. I think we, I think we, Publish it, get it out there that this select board meeting, we're going to spend half an hour. We'd like your input. These are some of our priorities. What do you think? What transformed us in? Let the public know we've got not $10 million. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. And, um, you know, and have a couple of select board meetings. I'd be open to that. Um, I think we should personally, I think we should do a survey too. I think we should have an electronic means and, you know, ask for name address. Are you a resident of Johnson as part of the survey? Uh, just so we can verify that they are a resident. Um, but I think that um, we should do electronic means of feedback um, and probably having a box in the office with a paper form wouldn't hurt me either. Yeah. I mean, it seems like we could put out something on Public Forum with a link to the deadline. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think select board meeting or be, you'll get as much participation from the public as any other time. If we post it out on Public Forum and make a big splash that you know, we're going to offer. Coffee, donuts, pizza. Where you're really going to hear is this is going to come into our current year budget. So when we close out the books, we're going to have this money sitting there. We're going to have to show that in our proposed budget next year. Exactly. That is when you're going to hear from all of the voters at town meeting day, and they're going to have all kinds of good ideas. That are different from where we're going to be proposing in our budget for money to go. And you know, you're going to hear from the ones that want to just apply it all directly to reducing taxes. That might not be the best use of money, but you're going to hear that. And you're going to probably hear some pie in the sky type of things. So. Yeah. We, we don't have a time frame to spend this. Today. Uh, 2023, we have to be. So it has to be committed. Committed, yeah. not spent. Not, not spent. necessarily spent. Okay. We have another that year, like, I believe, to spend. Three years. I thought it was 2024. Yeah. And we have to spend it by 2026. 2024. We'll be in 2023 next year at time meeting. So no, I don't think it's by a year. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I guess we'd be discussing 2024 budget. So, yeah. What's the time frame of? Public input the next couple of months, or I'd like to 
know, I'd like to start on that now, uh, especially if we're going to dedicate like a few minutes over a couple meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, or I think that sounds like a good idea of like, we're going to, at our meetings, we'll spend a little bit of time brainstorming about different ideas and then develop a survey based on that feedback to distribute afterwards. Or do you want to, I guess, what kind of approach do you want to take? Do you want to do it all at once of so surveys and public meetings? What do you, um, so before we go to the how, did you have other means that you guys were thinking? I, I was going to second what Eric said about the standard budget process would be to bring a surplus into the budget and the voters passing the budget essentially is the approval for the spending of those assets or those surpluses. I did have a conversation with Katie Buckley, who is the VLCT coordinator on the ARPA funds, and she had a little bit different take on the that process of treating it as a voter approved surplus. Um, her opinion was that the select board ultimately has the authority on how those funds get spent. So I think we should, I totally agree with Eric that that would be the normal practice that we would put it into the budget. We would show it as line items. And if the voters approve the budget, they're essentially approving how it gets spent. But with regard to the specifics of the ARPA funds, Katie Buckley at least initially said that decision rests with the select board, period. So I think so we, we should have a totally different ARPA budget, essentially. What's that? We could have a, a different ARPA budget. Is that what that's implying? Well, the surplus, um, yeah, the, the fund, the ARPA funds, the authority to spend those ultimately, regardless of the public process, yeah, ultimately resides with the select board. Yeah. And her take on, I told her, about, I, I was actually discussing this with another town that I'm working with, but they said our normal practice would be that we include that in the surplus and we seek voter approval to do that. And that therefore is, you know, sort of the public process. She said ARPA funds are a little different um, than a normal um, town surplus because the funds are not raised by the taxpayers. They are right. ARPA right. funds right. and therefore, so it's, I. I totally agree with what Eric says, but there may be a little nuance here that I think we should have Brian further investigate. There are some accounting questions that I don't have satisfactory answers to about how to handle the ARPA funds and the general budget. And Duncan, my questions are the same. Duncan's right now, it's not a cash surplus. And so that's a How exactly is it different than a cash surplus? This is a monumental difference. The, the, the process is going to probably be a little bit different. Yeah. It yeah. is coming in as revenue replacement, but it's not from the same source. So it's likely to have some different rules. Um, and we do still have to do some reporting on it, the reporting that we have to do as revenue replacement is a lot less than what we would have to do if it was project based, but there is still some federal reporting we have to do. So we have to make sure that the state compliance, which is another point in the discussion about it's not exactly cash surplus because it still does have some federal strings attached to it. Right. Does it, from an accounting perspective, Rosemary, is there any way that we need to handle it from your perspective? Right now, I have it in a separate fund and a bank. Yeah. And it probably, spending it out probably should be tracked separately, yes. too, which I assume we would do. Yes. yes. So that's on the cash management side of it. Are you following the budget, the budgeting in terms of? Actual, the actual budgeting side of it at all for our the way the requirements for our pro. Like, do you have any, do you disagree with anything that, have you been following it close enough to have additional information from what Duncan and Brian are talking about? Okay. Okay. 
So there, there will be a little bit more detail about it, but uh, I don't have it now. But I, I don't know exactly how it's going to look at that uh, when it comes to writing next year's budget and how that works. In. Well, we, okay. do, we do know we're going to have some public input. We're, we're a couple of yeah. We're going to put it out there. And, and however, however, it shows up in our. Budget. We have a lot of stuff on our schedule, schedule, but we can do a half an hour each meeting. Yeah, I, I think the, the meetings are that you guys something are, like that. Yeah, I think the details that we have to work out still are generally not. <laughs> Um, so let's do this. Let's um, we'll plan for one of our June meetings. I want to just look at the calendar to make sure I'm not saying. Um, I need to look at the the um, list of agenda items that we have mapped out for the different months because we have some really heavy months and we have some really light months. Some of our months tend to be light, so I think maybe our June one of our June meetings fitting this in is very appropriate, and maybe August or September for the second. Um, a little closer budgeting time. Um, it will look good too, but I do want to look at what the full list of items are. Um, Evan, did you have anything else that you want to? Uh, Half an hour for a couple of meetings, and we can get public input and discuss good things for the town. So let's, let's do our best to get it out to the public with a week's notice so that they can. I think we need to get more than a week's notice now. I think yeah. we need to send a like keep an eye out. This is coming, and then okay. in advance. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think too with the I would like to get an electronic survey out there, um, and with the survey, I think we could just push it out every. You know. It should definitely correspond with our meetings we're going to have, but we probably could push it out once a month until our last meeting or something like that, too. We don't have the money in our budget for an electronic survey. There are electronic <laughs> surveys. We don't need to spend money. No need. <laughs> You're Eric, buying, right? Eric's buying coffee and dinner. Uh, okay. So, quick question on the electronic survey and the meetings. Do we want to? We can make an electronic survey that's open ended, uh, you know, that asks open ended questions about what do you think the town should spend the money on and start that now if we want to. I think anybody who is really passionate about spending the money on certain topics is going to make the time to come to one of two meetings. Electronic surveys, great, but I guess I could log on. 10 or 20 times and get whatever thing I wanted passed right to the top. It's, it's relatively, I don't think it directs the board in a very decent way, better than people here. I'm sorry. And everybody has the ability to connect with every single person up here. If you just go to the town of Johnson's website, get enough time to log on, take a survey, have enough time to type in townofjohnson.com. We can do a survey. I'm just saying I don't. I, I think electronic like survey is going to be a pretty it is a, an essential part of seeking public input because it will act as a different audience. Like I said at the beginning, my, my preference for this is to brainstorm and come up with ideas using our meetings and, and our conversations with people and then use the survey to help refine the, those discussions rather than starting the discussion with the survey. But I just want to throw, I want to make sure that we have the discussion that, you know, you know, just that I'm not steering the, the conversation just based on my preference. Okay, let's keep moving, shall we? Yep. Anything else on that one, Ryan? I think I'm good. Oh. All right. Next up, we have ATV law enforcement updates and potential options. So, this is uh, some updates on uh, the discussion that we've had about enforcement. 
Uh, we had the, the big update that I have about this is uh, around using the consoles uh, for AGB enforcement. So uh, I'm going to address this with Sorry, Alex. everybody present too. Uh, at our last meeting, we had a, a discussion. And as part of the discussion, not our last meeting, but at the April 1st meeting dedicated to AGB, we had some discussion about you know, that enforcement was one of the key pieces that people wanted to see uh, when it comes to any update for AGB. So we had some, uh, some discussion there, and I've got some updates on what some of our enforcement options are, um, and in particular around the constable. So the uh, GMA, one more time with the GMA TV, because it's so the Green Mountain ATV brokers uh, have expressed support for using the constables. Uh, their preference was, would be for uh, paying for time and equipment of a person that the board trained, paid for the constable training for, and was hired by the board. Um, rather than, you know, it was kind of raised at a good would, would they pay for the train? Would they pay for everything? And it doesn't really sound like that's a great fit for them. Uh, the reason they're concerned about paying for the training is, you know, they pay to train somebody and then we make the decision about their employment status. So they can pay to train somebody and then we could let them go and ask them to pay for, to train the next person or something along those lines. So it, it is leave them with a lot of security. But if they pay for the equipment, the equipment is a permanent fixture that can go on to whoever we train up and have in place in that position. So I think that if we choose to go with the constable model, I think that that's a pretty fair arrangement for uh, the ATV club and, uh, and the town. The other update I have on that was a discussion we had about uh, what the law enforcement uh, options were for our constables. Uh, the constable position was changed in 1996 at Calvi from a, an elected position to an appointed position. Um, I was able to find that vote and evidence of that. I could not find any evidence of the town actually voting to restrict the law enforcement authority of the constable position. That seems to be a practice that we adopted at about the same time. Um, in meeting minutes, the constable position stops being referred to as just the constable, so it's being referred to more often as animal control officer or animal control slash constable, you know, kind of emphasizing other aspects of the job rather than just strictly constable. Um, consulted with BLCT about that. They laid out a few options for us if we want to uh, start conducting or start giving law enforcement capability to our uh, our constables. But it it appears that it's not something that is. It appears that it's something that we've chosen to do, not something that we're required to do. But we've chosen to limit it. But we we're not bound by. That when when we took that to the voters at that time, it, it was an elected position. As soon as the constable was elected, they came in with all of their arresting powers and, and everything. If you changed it to an appointed position, then they would only have those powers after attending the police academy. Yes. And when we, uh, when the voters changed it to appointed, we wrote up a job description for the constables and it excluded any arresting powers or anything that was not statutorily given to the constables. And, and like you say, they did become mostly a uh, penal control officer. Yeah, that, 
that's a good point. That is an additional requirement for them to have law enforcement powers is we have to grant it to them, but we also have to send them to a training course. Not powers, law enforcement certificate and proof of training. Yes. Uh, so it, it is, it does appear to be an option for us. Uh, I have tried to locate the job description and I haven't been able to at this time. It's beyond the way. Well, it's an option. It's an option for law enforcement, provided the person who is the in an appointed constable uh, position has that law enforcement training and certific certification. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, I guess that's more of what I, I mean is that it is an option we could pursue. There are steps in order to enable it. Uh, there would, uh, there's some advice they have on language that our ATV order that should include if our primary enforcement mechanism is expected to be uh, a local constable instead of general law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's there's a number of steps if that's the path we choose for improved enforcement. But it is a, an option for us. Okay. So the piece that I think is missing in the discussion with the BLCT attorney is whether or not she was fully cognizant of the fact that the voters had authorized the appointment rather than the election. And the distinction there that I think is important is, I believe, I could well be wrong, that um, once the board is authorized to appoint rather than have it be an elected position, the board is also authorized to create a job description, which would in practice over the last 30 years, um, limit the ability of the constable to perform quote law enforcement um, powers and duties, which is it's described that way in the statute. Um, which is the only reason I'll use it in that context. Um, so in my mind, in addition to the appointed constables having by statute to be required to have taken minimum training in order to exercise law enforcement activities on motor vehicles, it would also require us to modify the job description to authorize that and I will say just as a personal opinion, that's gonna be a path that I'm gonna to have to think long and hard about. Um, fair, <clears throat> the thing that just strikes me, Duncan, is that a job description, um, well, it gives you grounds for expectation setting, um, a broad job description, description doesn't inhibit or prohibit your ability to serve in, in specific ways. Um, so I don't think anyone's job description fully describes what the job is that they do at any given point. Um, while it is a directive uh, for employment, it's not necessarily something that would be restrictive, I don't believe either when, in the way you're using it. I just worry about leaning on a job description in that way. Well, I, I agree. And I, I think it's, I think for that reason, it's probably important for us to, if we even consider, even, even if we don't consider whether or not we want to use the constables for law enforcement purposes, mm -hmm. um, we should probably get the question answered. <laughs> um, you know, the VLCT opinion was, um, absent the voters through a specific statutory process to restrict, restrict or rescind the law enforcement powers of the constables, they've got that power. Right, so, assuming they're certified. Assuming they're certified and they meet the other statutory requirements. My, you know, I think the, the theory that the board, the prior board had operated under was making that appointed allowed them uh, to appoint or remove um, a constable 
um, and to set forth the job requirements in which they restrict it. You may be right that the statute supersedes the ability of the select board to establish those roles and responsibilities by job description. Um, and I think that's a question that we probably should get answered one way or the other. Because, you know, in my, I would have a lot of heartburn. Um, there have been too many cowboys out there um, in towns with constables who have exercised law enforcement um, authorities. And it's a huge additional um, liability for the town to have uh, constable. It's, you know, it's like, it's like having a police force. Yeah. Um, it opens us up to all kinds of potential liability. And I, as I said, I personally would have a great deal of hurt by going down that road. <laughs> but I'm just one member. Uh, we need the answers to questions. Okay. But also, it would be nice to have some sort of an idea of what this would cost the town. I know it's hard to pinpoint. Um, but training and more insurance. Yeah, so we'll work on gathering some more of those questions, uh, financial questions. I've got the question out to the league uh, following up on how this ties in with the vote on uh, appointed versus elected. Uh, we'll have probably a couple more conversations with the, with the league about teasing out some more of the specifics about what our options are. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot to weigh in about the job description, about exactly where our authority lies with that. In practice, uh, the requirements for uh, the constable to have law enforcement authority requires that they be an appointed constable. It also requires that they complete training. We don't send our constables to require training. So whether it's by job description or by the fact that we don't give them the training that they need to have law enforcement powers, our constables do not have law enforcement powers and, and have, have not uh, for quite a few years. And that's uh, whether it's by the job description or by the the, just the way we run the position. That's been true. Um, okay, so uh, on in terms of looking at costs for constable, I, I just question whether it's worth Brian's time looking at costs for different things if there isn't an appetite to explore it by the board. Uh, if there is an appetite to explore it, then cool. But not hearing that there's not an appetite. I've heard heavily that there's answers to the questions. So, so right. well, okay, well, I'm not suggesting there is or isn't, I guess I'm asking the question. Is there an appetite for Brian to spend time looking into the costs around training constable? Um, for me, yes, because <clears throat> I need to know what everything is would cost for options for solving a problem that several taxpayers have brought to the board. Sorry. I need, we have to research options for getting law enforcement for ATVs, the problem that several residents have brought to the board. This is one option and we don't have all the answers yet. So my appetite is to get them. Okay, thank okay. you. I suspect it won't take Brian very long to find out what the cost of the constable training is, so I'm not opposed to having that information. Okay. Okay, we have three. We can find it. I mean, uh... I, I know what it is, I just don't want it. Oh. I don't know it well enough to. Oh, the number off the top of my head. Okay, well, you could have saved us like five minutes, Brian. But it is. <laughs> Whatever it is, we should take it out of the chair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, cool. Finding the training is easy, and I suspect that finding the insurance cost, which is likely to be another, the, the, the training itself, 
you know, we might have to discuss a different different range of compensation because uh, we're not really set up for a patrol. Uh, but we're, we'll be looking to the Green Mountain ATV and VASA, of course, and contributions for ATV related patrol. Um, but I think the insurance is likely to be another huge mm -hmm. big one. I can ask for that. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of research I'm going to do. It's just going to be if we made this change, what, what would the cost increase be? Can you just answer is the constable training the same thing as law enforcement certification? It is a particular law enforcement certification. There, there is, it's is done at the police academy, but it's it's not the same certification you would get to become a law enforcement officer at uh, you know the sheriff's department, but it's related and they have some overlap. Okay. Okay, thank you. So would they be limited to ATV uh, enforcement? That's what I want to get into with the what is the authority of our how how strict can our uh, job description be? Can we say that you're enforcing this, but this other thing that is law enforcement related, like you is not under your authority. We we want you to enforce you know, just this, these few texts that we want to assign to it. Uh, that I don't have a good answer for yet. Um, yeah, so, uh, I would also like to know what the difference between, I don't feel like a job description is good enough personally. Um, and I would think that we would need some sort of an ordinance to make it town law for it to be truly enforceable in terms of boundaries. Um, be my guess or whatever the law certificate is maybe the boundaries of the constable can do um, but I, I find it really hard to believe the job description would do that by way of a, a small horror story when i years ago worked for the town of georgia <clears throat> the constable there um, paid for his own law enforcement training at the police academy bought his own ak-47 with his own funds bought his own car bought his own radar equipment, bought his own bubble, um, and started enforcing uh, state traffic regulations in the town of Georgia. <clears throat> it was not that's a pretty, pretty scary. Scary. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah, that's not gonna go there. Yeah. So we we need to investigate more about what are the limits of our control over the position. It is a state defined position with certain roles and responsibilities. Global ordinances can interact, ordinances or policies can interact with that. We gotta find where the limits are of uh, our interaction. Yeah, okay. Um, Spencer, did you have something that you wanted to share too for our law enforcement? Oh yeah, that'd be great. Um, shout out the email. Um, just to continue on the, I guess, a little bit of the constable thing. I spoke with NASA, and we're definitely willing to, if it's, you know, for ATP control, we're definitely willing to pay for that constable sign and everything like that. NASA has a budget for that, so we definitely will do the check for that. Um, and then I also have an email from uh, the executive director of NASA. It's, um, it says, uh, Basically, they reached out to Essex County Sheriff's Department and they're looking to pass a, them to put together a contract for uh, patrol for ATVs. Um, right now, it sounds like they can start with uh, six weekend patrols. So they could either do a Saturday or a Sunday, four to six hours either day. So it sounds like six weekends. Four to six hours each day, or Saturday or Sunday. So, um, and then basically, he asked us as a club, Danny, executive director, what trouble spots we you know, seem like you have, and we gave him a list. And he says, going to definitely keep me updated, but it sounds like we're able to get the biggest thing that's hard is, you know, law enforcement. We had the funds for it, but a lot of people can't do it or they don't have the manpower. It's not like we're not trying, you know, we 
we know of course it needs to be done. So we're definitely willing to pitch in for that, just finding the manpower to do so. And if we do get a council, you know, I think they should be, you know, it's up to the border people. But don't train them just to patrol ATVs, you know. I don't want to take the town spend them whatever hundred grand someone to, just so we can patrol ATVs, you know, but if they're doing that patrol, unless it's caught in the mass or more than willing to pay for that official sign. Yeah. Thanks. The times that you remarked uh, six times or something, is yeah. that all in Johnson or in the more count? Um, it's probably most, the, well, the trouble there is we gave them. It's mostly in Johnson. It seems like some of my part, uh, mostly Johnson now for sure. Um, and then, yeah, it'd be like four to six hours. Either Saturday or Sunday. It's not like six weekends they can commit to very much right now. Um, another thing, I guess I can just point at that. You know, if 18 years start seeing the law enforcement, word gets out. And hopefully that keeps people in check better, for sure. You know, takes that one time where all we sit here, you know, just like sheriffs and the car are sitting down the road, we know where they sit. Fire station here to get out. They never know if they're there or they're not. So, got to keep it in check. So, hopefully, that would help with that 18 years for sure. And I will keep people the board up to date on figure any more details on that. Yeah, keeping us up to date. Thank you. Thank so you very much. The gist of this discussion is because the sheriff's department is just basically sitting there. Yeah, we won't do any ATV stuff. So if I want to ride my ATV down Main Street at 50 miles an hour, the sheriff's department is just going to... Uh, the sheriff's department will not wave at you. <laughs> you <laughs> they, hope. They will, if there is a blatant um, law being broken or something that doesn't look right, they will stop and have a conversation and potentially cite someone, from what I understand, but they won't patrol for ATV violations. And... Uh, will often not respond to Thank complaints. You. That's my understanding. Again, I go back to that. We're paying the sheriff's department. We ought to have some input into what they do. That's my personal question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've been willing to pay that. Yeah. For out of even though the town's budget, we basically have to back that they don't have to make power to so, so. so that's what we're yeah. Also yeah, we all want enforcement. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so I do have one other ask, uh, basically, of the public and anyone on the board is that um, I did ask if folks were interested in being involved in exploring um, law enforcement options for ATV. Um, I've had a response, um, maybe two. I have questionable about one, whether one was a response or not. Um, but I am still interested in, in hearing from anyone who may be interested in exploring further. Um, I think that we should, to your point and your point earlier before, we should explore all options and have, you know, respectful conversation about what those options could and shouldn't be, frankly. Um, and maybe get uh, a few steps forward. So if anyone is interested, I'm asking that please do reach out to me um, and I would like to add you to it, Marga. Thank you. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. Um, the uh, committee that has formed uh, years ago, Neil, you were on this committee, it encompassed all of the ATV issues. And I think it's, there's something to that. There's so much, there's so many different issues, and there's so much overlap and you know intersections that I wonder if just having this narrow scope of just this law enforcement piece. And you know, there's a lot of us who give the time to come out tonight. If, we, if we're going to have like separate committees, it's just it's a huge time commitment for all of us to start try to stay in communication and, and you know attend 
meetings mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. So I'm proposing having a do over of the 2006 where we have a committee that looks at the whole bill. Um, thank you for your feedback. And uh, I think that we have. We have an ordinance in place right now. Um, and I think we have some things we need to work through with the ordinance we have in place right now. And one of those things is a significant thing that I hear about all the time. When I get an ATV email, it is almost always about some sort, sort of enforcement. Um, not always, but almost always. And I think that that is something that is impacting us with our existing ordinance. And for that reason, I would like to narrowly focus on law enforcement and you know to get some action there and some steps moving forward and then i would i you know i'm not going to be a decider here the board but i'd be open to having a discussion about a different group exploring things further if the board would support that um, but very specifically the law enforcement came up in our atv specific discussion and we had a conversation at that time about a narrow focus on Sorry about I enthusiastically jumped in too soon. If, if it is just true law enforcement, then I'm gonna I'd like to pull out because I sure. have an agreement on having you uh okay the older. Is there opportunity for us to have, just ask some questions of the board with this with the past presentation? On the and past presentation, um well I would like to keep our focus on law enforcement very specifically tonight, if we could, so that we can get done in a timely manner. We had a really long last meeting. Any questions about the enforcement? Okay, yep. Go ahead. If you have a question about it. Uh, well, I think maybe you answered it. So, what we're enforcing, or what's going to be enforced, is the 2006 ordinance, mm -hmm. with not 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 the other things that we've been working. Correct. On. Yep. Um, and where I'm curious with the constable, like. We talk, we talk about the job description, training, and such. But I'm curious as to like what that would really look like. You know, Roger Marcu just like reading through, you know, his comments uh, over the years that like enforcement for as a sheriff, enforcement for HD riders is limited. Um, it's unsafe to uh, chase or ride after an ATV rider. ATV should not be mixing with low traffic. And then a state police um, lieutenant who's up in the Craftsbury area pretty much said the same thing that, that it's, it's difficult to do, it may be unsafe to do. So I'm just wondering, kind of agreeing a bit with, with Evan, of like, is this something that, you know, like, what's, is this something, I just don't understand, like, what this person's going to do when our top law officials in the area say that, you know, it's, unsafe and it's incredibly limited yeah i don't know what our constable would do we don't have a job description for what our constable would do and i don't know if anyone on the board would want to speak to that i think we have to do more research on that but what i would say um and the Lamoille county sheriff's department is what i'm going to refer to them as has said that they won't do it and it's unsafe I do find it interesting that two adjoining counties have found a way to govern or, you know, whatever, however you want to word it. And the Lamoille County Sheriff's Department can't figure that out. Um, and maybe there's a reason for that. But even with what they're saying, there are other counties that have figured this out and already have a model for it. I think it's more refusal and excuses than it can't be done. Essex County, Orleans County, Franklin County actually has one. I guess Essex County doesn't touch us. Uh, don't they do something in Washington County? That's good. Thank you. So that'd be three or four. What's the port again? Huh? What is the port? What county is that? No ports, Orleans. Orleans. So, Margo, I, I, I think. Sorry. sorry. Oops. Um, I, I think one of the one of the reasons Roger and other like state police have said that was there was a death resulting from a vehicle chase uh, of an ATV user where the ATV user was was killed. This was a number of years ago, so I, I kind of get what Roger is saying with regard to using a cruiser to chase an ATV, 
probably not the smartest thing in the world, but I think some of the other counties have looked at a model more like the snowmobilers where they use a snowmobile to patrol. Um, I think some of these other uh, departments may be using an ATV to do the patrols. Um, and I, I wouldn't want, you know, I wouldn't want an ATV user to get um, killed from a high-speed chase either. So, and I think the officer has to have some discretion <clears throat> in that regard, but. Yeah. Just to add to what you said, you know, Roger Park, who also said that they didn't have ATVs to pursue ATV riders. And, and so that was another reason they didn't, you know, want to do it. And I, and we, those of us who have called the sheriff's office have often been told that they don't want to spend their time on it and so forth. And it seems like it would be a select board um, trying to somehow wrangle a promise out of that. If you, if you were going to try to be responsible for the ATV ordinance that you have, that you would get some response from the sheriff's department. And, and since they're not doing that, then I, I was sort of happy tonight to hear that you were you were discussing how the ATV committee was willing to give equipment and that the board was going to be the responsible party for finding the enforcement of person. And that sort of gave me immense relief because I think that's a good division between the two parties rather than having the ATV club patrol itself. I like the idea of having the board be responsible for the constable and look at that, that person's performance, set the parameters of what they do, and then continue to have them or not, depending on what they how they perform. And so I really think it can't be the ATV club that polices itself. And I don't think that they're sort of in the job of kind of, you know, uh, looking at the performance of the patrols, they send out and see how good a job they did or whether they look the other way or whatever. So I'm happy that you're at least thinking about, you know, having the board as the body that uh, hires the constable in terms of whether they become, you know, have law enforcement capabilities, which means carrying firearms. Uh, you know, I have my a pause on that, but certainly I would hope that they would be able to issue fines and even impound ATVs for multiple offenses, things like that. So, I mean, I think this is all to be worked out and I'd be happy to be part of the committee that looks at how the enforcement mechanism is enforced, but uh, I'm happy that it's in the court of the select board and ultimately the town to hire and then also to keep a record of how many calls there are to the to the town hall see you know how many complaints happen i don't think that the atv club would would do that so just for your purposes to know how you know how many complaints there are and know what kind of a problem it is in the town it's good to have it reside with the board um jack we're gonna go jackie i'll call on you unless anyone else wants to speak first and we're gonna just wrap it up right after your questions Jan, would you prefer? Yeah, I just have a real quick question. I emailed you guys earlier about um, can you do anything about the how the Royal Valley Rail Trail enforces there? No ATV. And how if there's enforcement there? I don't know the answer. Apparently not. I don't think there's any enforcement. They don't even mow their own right away. So I doubt they would send anybody out there to look at it. Um, I know but it is part of the was on the rail trail and there was an ATV that came right up right to us. And they were, you know, very respectful. They were going to us, you know, at slow speed. And they stopped whenever I hailed them um, to talk. Um, but they certainly said that uh, they. It's not that they said that they didn't know ATVs were not allowed on there, but they um, felt that they had the state, they registered their vehicle in the state so that they could use it. Yeah. 
Apparently they can't read. Obviously. <laughs> okay, Jackie. This kind of leads a little bit into what I, I, I'm going to ask you. Expensive uh, here, your your club. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. And then you know too. So what yeah. I'm looking for is, is there a roster someplace? Uh, uh, and we'll start with Johnson residents, and then you can ripple out to the other towns because I know this is quite a problem. It's for many towns. A roster does a roster exist with people's names? A registration, you mean? Uh, yeah, registration with the vassal plate, with their insurance certificate, with their helmet making model. If there was a roster like this, and maybe it exists, maybe you have something like this, it would really help someone like that. Or someone like me, who yesterday I, I saw a vehicle come down on roads not permitted to be uh, produced, um, you know, pre season, not permitted to be used. But if there was a roster that exists, does a roster like this exist? Any place? Well, that's uh, when you register the general access detail, you have to do all of those things. You have to prove insurance. You have to get uh, your plate number out that for active registration. So uh, I guess my thing would be if you can get a picture of a plate that someone's illegally using, like the rail trail, if we took a picture of a plate, you're more welcome to send it to me. Um, well, well, can we get um, open well, there, get so okay. that's one of those things that that's like a registration, right? Like if they're registering through the state, we don't have access to car license plate information. We wouldn't have access to registration information. There. Do you have a roster? Most of the clubs, we don't have, like, personally, I don't have a roster. I don't have all that information. So what I'm saying is if you can get a picture of a plate, and I found out about the information I can send to the VASA and make it public. The plate is registered to the ladies in the year one. Sign the sign essentially. So essentially, you know, it could be you know, it shows your address. Everything. It's essentially a, so, okay. So I'm going to wrap it up, but essentially, it would be a complaint. You'd issue a complaint through VASA about a VASA member if you could get inf identifying information that VASA so could use. And then VASA, VASA would yeah. control yeah. that. Part. Town, um, a, a listing. I mean, that's a roster. We're not law enforcement. Uh, and but so, if, a constable? if we had a constable, then they would have to, in theory, I would assume they had have, would have access to law enforcement records. Okay. Um, right. I would assume. Yeah. Uh, we're going to wrap up, so let's move on to the next item. Thank you for the good questions, um, good conversation. And Neil, thank you for your willingness to help us figure this out. Very much appreciate it. Uh, okay, thanks, Jackie. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming. Um, okay, next up is the local emergency management plan. So, our annual local emergency management plan. Uh, <laughs> you asked if this was really assigned. There is one change we need to make. Is it the PLC2? Uh, what page? What? From page? From page? Page. Uh, page 11. Yeah, from page. Okay. Uh, the date needs to change. It says the local emergency management plan was adopted May 1st of 2019. And does, <laughs> does the point of contact... Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It, it was. <laughs> does the point of contact 2 need to change? Because Gordy is no oh, longer right. an emergency management coordinator, along with his email. His email is definitely wrong. Is he still a coordinator, though? No, no, he's, no. Not. he's not. Okay. Is that trying the phone number? Everything's. Yeah, hey, you can leave his phone number there. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Nasty. So. With corrections for point of contact to be changed to, uh, you want to do Steve Hatfield? That was the village. That's me. Evan. Okay. Taking the change with this to Evan. Uh, the rest of the document will run through with you. Well, I'm uh, worried. I have to tell you, Brian. I'm worried because you edited this as we went along. Uh, strictly speaking, this is actually a second, a separate file. But the one we edited. The, the first two pages. 
we went through this whole yep. thing. It, that starts on page 13. Oh, yes. Okay. The first two pages are a separate file, and that's the, the adoption form. It's a separate form from the plan itself. The plan itself. Yeah, because that has April 13th, 2022. Yeah. Gotcha. Updated. Okay. Yeah. So, could we motion to approve with amendments? That we amendments to the adoption plan. Second. Uh, hang on. Does the chair need to sign this? Yes, and Eric needs to sign it. Motion to authorize the chair and Eric Osgood to sign the local emergency management plan with the amendments of the LEMP adoption date being May 2nd, 2022. Point of contact to name and information being updated. Why did you have to throw that one in there? Wait, I just noticed my name is in there. Where is your name? Uh, it's on page oh. 19 at the bottom of the I page. must have missed oh, yeah. that. Second select word alt. Yes, you got volunteers. I'm just Thank you. Oh. <laughs> you <can> think, Eric. <laughs> Thought you'd, thought you'd sneak that one by. Yeah, no, it's right. So you're fine with that? Okay. Right. Okay. okay. It's just a point. Any of the village items they haven't seen since last time we met, right? No, not to my uh. Peter Dodge, on page uh, 19, it's an email address. He probably does need to get an email. He has one. Or a phone uh, he might phone. he might have one. So well, he, there's a, there's already a phone number in there for him. It's the eight oh two. Did you confirm that uh, Mike Salazonia is still the public? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll be able to get a hold of Mike. That's still that was a premature motion. I can withdraw it if you want. My so motion stands. People could vote. You already did second it, I thought. And we no, seconded we... it before you actually made the motion. Well, there's a number for me. <laughs> okay, let's get the motion. At, let's get the motion actually active. So we have a motion on the floor with updates for the first page. Do we have a second? Okay, any discussion? Now let's keep talking. Sorry, Eric, what was your question? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. In your motion included um, Eric and Beth signing it, was that right? Yes, it actually, my motion included Eric and the chair signing. The amended copy. <laughs> Wait, waiting. Okay, no more discussion. I don't like it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Eyes have it. So, Brian, you'll let us know. I'm sorry, I don't think it's like that. Yes, I'll be. I need the update. I just noticed this. Okay. What's next? Next up, uh, review of cemetery maintenance request for proposals. So, the RFP, Duncan and I, uh, excuse me, Duncan and I got together uh, about making some changes to the uh, RFP for cemetery and gravestone maintenance. Um, we added some more details about kind of what we were expecting. Um, so uh, page 23 under scope of work, section two, uh, repair methods was greatly improved. 
Uh, I feel pretty comfortable about that. We, I don't think it's overly prescriptive, but I think that it sets a minimum standard of what we expect. You know, and we have the line in there about that uh, repair stone will be equal to or better than the methods of repair described below. Um, so it, it does a good job of setting it. This is our minimum expectation, but if you've got a particular technique or strategy that you want to, they can discuss that with us. Uh, also, uh, we talked at the very beginning on page 22 uh, about uh, identifying select board priorities for cleaning and repairs with a uh, call out that we expect the first year priorities to be uh, repairs in Whiting Hill Cemetery. Uh, you know, we believe that that's going to be. Uh, a good balance between letting the board and the bidder kind of set our own priorities, uh, but also giving giving them a good competitive uh, kind of where to look for recruitment for or initial bids, and what we're likely to do at the beginning. So that is a good way of getting. So not restricting the board, letting us use the same RFP for a multi-year contract and not just uh, you know a single site, but also kind of identifying this is really what we're going to likely to be covering in the beginning in the opening year. Satisfied with it, Duncan. I think you were. Uh, I think we kind of reached a, a good position by the end. Yeah, I I just wanted to you know clarify with the board that certainly my hope on this would be that we could focus on Whiting Hill, finish it, get it done, and then reprioritize as a board the other cemetery. So I guess I'm looking for you know feedback from you guys. Is is that what we really want to do? Is, is, do we want to focus on Whiting Hill, get it done, and move on? You said that was in the worst shape. So, uh... um, it's yeah, um, it, it's certainly been the focus of many years worth of, of effort. And the, part of my, the main part of my reason for wanting to focus on Wedding Hill is over half of it has already been done and all of the stones have been cleaned. So, really, um, you know, we're really, I, I did a quick assessment. I, I think I had 54 stones. Mm -hmm that are leaning, um, four or five stones that are uh, either uh, on the ground or you know need to be repaired. And I think three or four stones that actually are broken and need to be repaired. So I'm pretty confident that it's gonna take more than one year for this to be done. Um, so I think if we focus on Whiting Hill this year, we won't have any problems at all um, spending the balance of money that we've got in Whiting Hill. It's the most visible. It's the most visible. It's certainly the most visible, yeah. And I, 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 you guys gave me the authorization to finish cleaning the plot stones. Um, and so those will be all clean. And if we, you know, if we move to plot next, then you know, I think a systematic approach is going to result in the most cost-effective method of dealing with the cemeteries. Just my thoughts. Any objections to that approach? We'll see any. All right. So we'll post it. We'll circulate this. I told Brian I'd help him uh, try and find some people to send it to. <laughs> yeah. I don't expect we're going to have a lot of responses, but yeah, it's a pretty specialized uh, field. So we're not likely to have that many. It would tie in really well, and, and the vicinity is really well for having the historical society take over. <laughs> <laughs> You can shoot down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Do we need to do? Do we need a motion on this? 
I think uh, because there was no concerns, it's just circulating. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Go for it, Brian. All yours. Okay. Thank you for your help, Duncan and Brian, both of you. Um, I would just like to propose we actually move the Historical Society or let Society letter up above auditing services. <laughs> that way you don't have to sit through auditing services. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful <laughs> idea. <laughs> All right, so uh, I did my package here, but we it have page 47. Thank you. We have received a letter uh, of appointment of the Historical Society of Memory and Procedures for the Historical Society to report to the select board. Um, and Uh, we, everybody's received and read the letter from the Um Nick, would you like to speak about your letter? Uh, whether, it's, whether it's clear or not, and I'm not sure that our board is totally clear on where we stand on active members. If, like it says, it was our understanding that Evan resigned and now we've had since this letter was sent we've had another resignation mm -hmm. okay so we're down three people two people three two, two. It feels like three now yeah. Dean what? Uh, well but Duncan Phil well, I had Dean filled Dean's position, position so. okay. and Duncan resigned and I, you can speak to that, I guess. When it, when it and, and as of our last meeting, uh, there has been a further vote to change our bylaws to eliminate the expanding member of our committee to be a select board member. Or the designate. Yeah. It needs to just go through one more meeting. Uh, to be allowed. So I don't know what we don't know what your philosophy is on making appointments to us. Historically, since I've been involved, it's been with input from us. You advertise it. Give us some names or whatever, and we also, you know, try to urge people, interest people to come to meetings to assess their interest and to put in an application. At this stage, I don't know where we stand. So that is still true. That'll still be the process. We'll still we'll still post on your behalf, um, and you certainly can solicit folks to apply. Um, and we would likely take your recommendation uh, and appoint the person. So it would still go through the same process. Mm -hmm. So we're down to okay. So that process needs to. So essentially, you're asking us to post for two open positions on historical society. Uh, they're asking for their input to be heard before we appoint. And, and you're asking to make sure that you're involved in that appointment. Yeah. And you're asking that you're involved in that appointment. Yes. Yeah. Are you asking for us to sign off on your bylaw changes as well? Well, that was that was another item. Our, our bylaws were submitted. Uh, the letter says uh, select board declined to do so. I don't know if you officially declined to do so or just never got to it. I think you officially did. Uh, that's how I recall it. I think we did too, because I think we were we thought that you had the on, uh, autonomy to make your own by, bylaws, not requiring the select board to sign off. I think is how we discussed it. Does that sound seem right to everybody? No, you weren't there. Okay. That was, that was before. That was before the last time. Yeah. 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 Ye
I actually remember having a discussion about that. Yeah. I'm trying to recall the conversation, but it's not coming to you. Not what 100%. Okay, well, let me re let's re ask. Do we feel like the uh, historical society has the autonomy to create their own bylaws without requiring anything from the select board? Perhaps just informational to the select board? Do we have other committees, boards with their own bylaws, and do we approve them? When I was on rec committee, we created our own mission statement and provided it to the select board as informational and didn't require sign off. What is this? I understand it's being talked about as the bylaw, but this almost sounds like it's straight out of the agreement with the historical society in the town. Is it not? Well, that was kind of just a signed our agreement because bylaws. there should be no amendments to that without the town being involved because there is specific I don't believe delegation of responsibility. Okay, wait a second. There's two people talking. So you're saying that the bylaws are one thing and the agreement with the town is another. Right. I would be fine with them amending their bylaws as long as it didn't affect the agreement mm -hmm. with the town. And Duncan, you're. And it, uh, it would not affect the agreement. It would be bylaws only. And, uh, you know, in long distance past, the, the select board did want the various committees to run their bylaws by the select board for their approval prior to adopting them. And I can't, there was a specific instance and I can't remember what it was, but there was an instance of one committee that did something that the select board thought was a little off the reservation and they wanted to review and approve those beforehand. So that I think that's why the board submitted um, for your, you know, review and consideration. And I, I, my, I'm not no longer on the board, but my opinion as a select board member would be the Historical Society should still submit those, whether we sign off on them, physically sign off on them, or just acknowledge that we reviewed and agreed with them, it is immaterial to, to me. But, um. Yeah, I was thinking that the latter. Uh, I think that as a town entity or a town committee or commission or whatever, doesn't matter what we're talking about, that visibility to the board is important. Um, can I also speak to um, one thing about my resignation? Sure. Yep. Um, so part of the reason I resigned my position on the, on the Starker Society board, really kind of two reasons. One. Um, Dean West, a longtime and valued member of the Historical Society, stated at a board meeting that he really felt that it was important. While he didn't disagree that I was a good candidate for being on the Historical Society board, he really felt that it was important for the select board us to go through our duly adopted policy for making those appointments. Um, and I don't disagree with him. Um, you know, that whole thing happened pretty quickly at an organizational meeting and you know I Evan is right I could have said something I didn't it happened fast my resignation really is to give this board an opportunity to follow the process um and you know both go, go through the board's adopted policy I would be I I have really valued my work on the historical society um, and I would love to be able to continue to work with them, but there, was, there has been an expression of concern about whether a select board member being on a particular board would be able to vote on any issues that come before this board that affect the other board. Um, and I think as a personal matter, as an individual, I would know when it was right to recuse myself from voting on an issue and would do so. Um, but I've also said that I, if the rest of the board has heartburn about that, I would still think you're all wrong, but I, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna go against the, um, 
you know, the consensus of the board. So I, I guess I'm looking for a little bit of guidance because if 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 people feel that it's okay for me to be a select board member and a historical society board member, I might throw my hat back in the ring again for appointment. But I think it's I think that discussion should happen or it needs to happen before I feel comfortable doing anything. Sure. Um I don't see a problem with a select board member serving on other boards, but there is a conflict of interest when it comes to monetary items. <clears throat> and there's nothing wrong with more community service and passion about what you have passion about. But it would be a conflicted vote any way you went, because you would already be coming in supporting a vote. And you may have more information than the rest of the board. So maybe a, a select board member being on other committees could provide more information. But it would be a conflict of interest for them to vote on topics. And I know that it's easy to say that I'm a good judge of my own character and I can recuse myself. Everybody here could say that very easily. But judging your own character and the way everybody else sees it are two different things. Um, I don't know that, so character is one thing, bias is another. Oh, bias, sorry, not character. Um, so oh, my bad. Just no, you're clear. That's a very good correction. <laughs> uh, and we all have biases. Um, so I guess, what are your thoughts? Are you, yeah. I, I would sort of disagree with that then. Um, I think it's a, a definite conflict of interest if we are taking a vote as a select board and it's allocating money to the historical society or anybody serving on any other board or committee if they personally were gonna gain from it. And that's what a conflict of interest is. If you personally are gonna gain from it, I don't see a board member or a committee member as personally gaining from it. So I, generally speaking, I would not see a conflict of interest there. And I would support the board members being able to serve on different boards and committees because as we all know, uh, there's few people that are involved in a lot of things in the community and a lot of people wear multiple hats because other people don't step up. And we've had on this board, uh, rec committee members, skateboard park committee members, and there may be some others, I don't even remember now, but, um, and they voted on, you know, all the items that were appropriate. So I, I don't see a huge issue with it. Mark? Um, <laughs> No pieces. But um, <laughs> so I, I kind of see that um, it's fine for somebody on the select board to serve on another board. I just don't see how they personally, if, if somebody comes in and lobbies hard for the organization they're on, there's still only one or five of us. So I don't have a, I don't have a problem. And we would, and hopefully we would all know that. Um, yeah, I feel like we all have biases, every one of us, and I think that we have actually a good balance right now. I think our board is very well balanced in our uh, in our thoughts. Um, so I would support certainly anyone on the board being on any committee. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, and if there is any question about the conversation we're having, we certainly should feel free and open to challenge each other. Uh, and I, I would hope any of you would, if, if you felt that I was um, voting in a way or, or taking part in even taking part in the discussion um, that you had concerns about, I, I rely on the fact that you would all do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Good. Okay. So. Um, two postings. We will post them. Sounds like you might have a candidate already. <laughs> uh, Brian, you'll take care of that for yep. us. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the bylaws, 
just really quickly, and again, just a feel for bylaws. We saw them a while back. Um, were there any concerns with the bylaws that we saw? I don't recall seeing any, having any discussion about concern. Um, other than we did have some discussion about the select board member piece, but it sounds like you're working on that and we may see something later, but anything else worth mentioning right now? We did have another item on the, on the letter regarding, uh, again, whether we are a standing item uh, at board meetings or not. The discussion previously was every other month, but I think that gets confusing. I agree. Uh, put us on a month if nobody hears from us and nobody's here, then go right along. Yeah, uh, I I would like to just uh, so I put agendas together with Brian and some people from Evan on Evan on occasion. Uh, I would like to hear from you when you want to be on the agenda, and if we have something from you, we'll ask for your participation too, and just make it an open communication and when it feels appropriate. Uh, rather than having a standing, I just think it, it's better use of everyone's brain and time, <laughs> uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, we can probably right. that. The, the first meeting of the month, this meeting, might be an issue because it precedes our regular meeting with the second election, so perhaps we would be better to fall into the second one. But hey, an email from you asking if there's anything very quickly for you to respond, no. I think you're asking for them. Yeah, I, if you can initiate, I mean, if you have anything, like, board. don't wait for Ryan. You know, if you have anything, don't buy it, please do reach out. And that's the same for all committees. If the beautification yeah, committee or, we're talking or about, any yeah. committee wants to have something on the board's agenda, they should feel free to email Brian or you or any member. That is true. Yes. To that point, the last time we were here, we talked about the proposals for that. Floor, and we thought, I, I, actually, I guess I didn't see the you know, agenda and made it so well, but I guess I was under the impression that maybe the board was going to discuss it and talk about it and we have more to talk about at this point. We are going to discuss and talk about it in our next May meeting. So our two weeks from now, it will that discussion topic will be on our agenda. And we will be reaching out saying, hey, we're going to be talking about this. If anyone can attend, that'd be great. Okay. So that will happen. Yeah. Great. Yep. <laughs> yes. Just because of the historical society, I wanted to share with you that today when I was going through some old news and citizens, I found one from you know, well, 1997. And it was in the um, Paid advertisements, mm -hmm. and it was the Johnson Recreation Committee bylaws. <laughs> and it was signed by all five select board members. No, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I don't ever remember that. That's really funny. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Let's not do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for moving us together. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Sorry, you're most welcome. Next time you'll be. Next time I'll be better. Yeah, there's all kinds of good stuff coming up. <laughs> yeah, let's get paid in the long run. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> thank you, folks. All right. Well, thank you. Okay, auditing services, Brian. What all do right. we really need to know? Anything? We have one bit. One bit. You literally have one bit total. Wow, it's an out-of-state company. So we have the choice of recirculating or going with our, our one bidder. Are there any concerns about our one bidder? They had a lot of government experience yeah. and school, which is another big budget experience. And they looked, they submitted a good, what looks like a good proposal. Um, I can connect with uh, Sarah Macy at the LCT. Uh, we're going to want to talk to her about, uh, or at least gonna wanna consider bringing her in for some assistance with getting ready for our, for the audit. Mm -hmm. uh, but she also might 
you know, might be able to better evaluate this than that. I, I, it looks good to me. Um, and what is the audit schedule? The audit schedule, what I think it is. I'd like, I'd like to hear from Rosemary what, what her thoughts and opinions are, because she's going to be the one that's working most closely with the auditor. Do they have the audit schedule in front of them? Personnel that is from Vermont. They do other work in Vermont, but they don't. They had, uh, I thought they listed two people in their packet. Did they? Okay. I yeah, they did. Um, well, Heinsberg, Vermont, Jordan yeah. E. Nelly, Heinsberg. CPA, or Nelle, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Middlebury. And yep. they do say that Josh price, Quinn Middlebury that their price includes travel and all out of pocket expenses related to the audit and all client communications related to the audit. So it sounds like it's pretty inclusive. How does how the price compare to previous years' audits? 9500 mm, Has Rosemary seen a copy of this? For the next you three. Okay. Could you, you give you a copy? Yeah, it's 9500 for audit year 2022, 2023, 2024. It's the same. You can give her this one. Maybe we could. Uh, We'll get this on our next meetings item after I look through it. And you yeah, said you were going to touch base with who at BLCT? Sarah May Jim. I'm making that off. Okay. If you want me to say some more outside opinion, I can. Uh, Let's seek Rosemary's opinion first. And uh, and maybe actually Rosemary could speak to Sarah. Okay. And Rosemary. If you could take some time to review the audit, that would be great. You don't have to do it right this second. Um, and Sarah from the league, if you could connect with her and ask her questions enough to evaluate whether or not you think she would be helpful to us, um, that would be helpful to know. And then we'll put this on our next agenda as a follow-up. That sounds good to you. This price is very reasonable. It is, yeah. Okay. Did we budget ten thousand dollars in next year for this? I know. I know we budgeted something, huh? We have audit money in reserve. Audit reserve fund. Okay. I don't think go back into the budget for specifics. There's a bunch of Vermont towns, so maybe you know a town clerk, town treasurer that's dealt with them. Yeah, there's a boatload of them listed in the in the application or packet. Reach out to a couple of those contacts. You know, some of them are Yeah, I don't know. And just, just from my perspective on this, this this is for annual audits. This yeah. is, uh, if I'm remembering the RFP correctly, I believe that this is a three-year commitment. Uh, with the option to extend an additional two years. Okay, so and I just want to say that doing an annual audit would allow us to change the way that we're doing our budget process right now in a very significant way and a huge improvement. We would be able to use known numbers going forward um, in our surplus and not have to estimate the six months and end of year stuff. That's an enormous time sink um, from having done that in the past. So if we had an annual audit, we could do what most other towns do and use known budgeted um, surpluses and apply those without going through this incredibly complex process that we do in the budget. So Doing trying to estimate year end expenses and all that stuff. It would make them 
process so much easier. I know it's got a price tag associated with that, but of course. Well, yeah. So seek more input, uh, a little more background check on card one for candidate. Yep. All right. I rely heavily on Rosemary. Yes. This is really uh, hers. This is her wheelhouse. Hey, Rosemary. Yep. I'm just looking at the CTA from Champlain College. <laughs> That's a good recommendation. <laughs> uh, we would like to have somebody in place before uh, June thirtieth, but I, I they had a, a suggested schedule in here. Uh, Most, yeah. I, I at the lab, at the end, towards the end. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail though next time around after Rosemary has a chance to look at it. Would the board be comfortable approving it? On the condition that they follow up with these additional, I would be. We can approve it in two weeks. It's not. It's can not you? So Eric asked if the board would be comfortable with approving with contingency on the follow up and approval. Mark's open to it. Evan's suggesting we could do it in two weeks and it wouldn't hurt anything. How much of a how much difference would two weeks make? Okay. So okay we want to do. I think that would you know give Rosemary look just a little more cushion with making those phone calls and not sure. make her feel like she's under any kind of pressure to do so. Good with that. Okay. Okay, cool. So next time, next time around. Um, next up, let's talk economic development real quick, if we could plug that one in. So the select board uh, voted to raise $40,000 for uh, economic development. We had anticipated being able to share the costs of a, is that not the topic you wanted to? No, you're fine. You go on. No, he's just playing. Don't listen to him. All right. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> we had raised, raised $40,000 uh, starting next fiscal year for economic development. We had anticipated being able to share the cost of the village for a full time or, or near full time uh, economic development coordinator position. Uh, the village was not able to raise matching funds, so we have forty thousand dollars in total to spend upon that. Um, we kind of our, our most likely options, as I see them, uh, is pursuing either a part-time person. There might be a pretty good opportunity for us to share the position with another community, um, or uh, going about it contract work. Project by project. Uh, both would give us a little bit less than we were kind of hoping for with having somebody on full time who's a little bit more long term planning. Um, but they're both pretty good options for making the most of the money that we do have. Uh, that's kind of the lay of the land today. Uh, Remember who had raised the issue, so I don't know if that Eric. The question. Yeah, I just I wanted to put it on our agenda and start talking about it. Okay. Because you know we did get the approval for forty thousand. The village did not get their approval. Um, if we're going to be bringing somebody in, we need to start working on the job description, which probably is not a huge lift because we can take Leia's job description and dust it off. And and probably work a lot from that. But it also would require changing your job description because we would re be removing that element. Yep. Um, I think this, and then we're looking at July 1st, we'll have the money. Uh, so that's basically leaving up two months to uh, develop the job description, post the job, do the interviewing, the hiring, and I don't think we'll 
of anybody in the like July 1st. Um, if we started tonight, it probably would be in August before we get somebody on board. So I don't think it's too soon to start. And if anything, it's probably too late to start thinking about how we're going to do this, what we're going to do. And I, I'm really concerned that, you know, if we've got somebody in here, that could be the point person focusing on the Arbor funds and, and the Jewish property and some of these economic development elements that we're, we're missing out on and I'm, I feel we're missing out on. And uh, I guess I would try to encourage that we get that going somehow. I think we could and should devote the better part of a very near term work session to just that issue. When you say just that issue, are you talking about the job description or the option of trying to? I mean, we'll have to see how we're going to find a full time technology developer. We're not. Not for, not, not, not for that money, but but that's exactly what we need to figure out what we want that person to focus on. We need to figure out how many hours we could reason, you know, for 40,000 bucks, what, what can we get? You know, how many hours, what the hourly rate's going to be, and, you know, this sort of the pertinent aspects of the job description. I suspect that's going to take the better part of a meeting. And, and what? I mean, haven't I seen Cambridge advertising for this same person? No. Oh, that's a finance oh, administrator. Oh, I'm yeah. in mean, their budget. Yeah. yeah. They, and they hired somebody for their planning department. Uh, I, I talked to Cambridge yeah. a couple of times about, you know, whether we could coordinate on job descriptions, and that wasn't going to work out there. Our needs were too different than what their needs were going to be. We might still add, we might still let the person that they hired know that, that we're doing something, but the job description is not going to be similar. So we do reach out to other towns to say, oh, do you have a part-time person? I mean, I, if that would be slick. I, I think it'd be great going for uh, a part-time position rather than hiring somebody for project based. Yeah, we had talked about those two. It Why? sounds, I would like to get a part-time person in because I think that one of the big value values that we got out of Leia's work was some of her long-term planning, which is difficult to do with a contract position. But bringing in a contract position, if we can identify a project that we want them to do, like the Light Industrial Park, and bring in somebody in to focus just on that, can be very effective. And we do have... A project like that, um, you know, and we could talk about, you know, a couple other things that we've tossed around the ideas for about development downtown or other things. So we do have a couple of projects we can take good advantage of right now. Um, but I think a big value in the position would be long term vision and, and strategy and time to work on projects that don't have an immediate payout. Um. I would just challenge that if a person who is a contract hire can't do long term vision. I don't know that that is real. Uh, and uh, it depends on the type, it depends on what the, whoever the right fit is, it depends on what they're looking for uh, and the type of person we're looking for. Um, that's my first just comment. I don't, I feel like we should not limit ourselves in what we're looking for, what we're hiring for. Um, the second is that I'm really worried when we talk about long-term vision and we talk about um, all that could be, that the scope is very large. And when you talk about things that are very large, it allows for a lot of noise. And whoever, however we spend this money, I think we need to be really clear about what the focus is for the effort in spending that money and what the expected outcome is after the money is spent. And we have to make sure we protect whatever the resource, whoever the resource is from that noise. It can't be a bunch of little 
grant things here and there. If we're really talking about getting bang for our buck and and being serious about the things we've talked about in our project list. Um, so, and if we're looking for something that's a whole bunch of little things all over the place, then that's cool too. We just need to be really clear about like what the expectation is um, and what type of person we're looking for to fill that expectation. So I think that's a really valid point, Beth. And if we look at Leia's job description, that had a very specific uh, part of setting priorities because we, the board at the time was also very concerned about spreading, you know, that person way too thin. You know, this group comes in and wants a grant, this group comes in and wants a grant. Um, so I think that, I think Leia's job description had a lot of detail with regard to setting those priorities um, yes. and that ultimately resided, since she was a shared employee between the town and village, that ultimately ended up being a village trustee and a town um, board process. And in this case, it would be just the select board. But. I don't think there's enough money to hire a part-time employee because we could very quickly get into the same scenario of a part-time employee being at 23 hours a week. And then we need to add $8,000 in health insurance. That very quickly blows Forty thousand dollars right out of the water, where we could get heavy bang for our buck in contracted focused services, and stay within the allotted amount of money that the voters approved. Well, maybe if, maybe to start with, we don't go over twenty hours a week, or maybe we don't limit it. Like if we, I'm just thinking from like from my world, from my work world, we want somebody to whatever effort they put into it, we want them to put that effort in and focus on that thing. Now, if we hire somebody who prefers to work 50 hours a week, um, you know, so be it. Go for it. You work as much as your heart, you work to your heart's content. The voters and did not approve something that would support an employee that worked that many hours. Who cares? Who cares how many we, hours? We have, a, we have a maximum limited dollar amount. We have a, it's, it's project based. It's not, that's what I mean. If we're hiring someone else project based with expectation. Yeah, so if they want to work for 25 cents an hour, they can? Yeah, I don't <laughs> want to. I thought you were talking about an employee. No, 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 no. Project. Yeah, no. Gotcha. no I'm not so shouldn't this be part of a, a work session discussion? It should, about all, yes. all of this? It definitely I should. think that's Eric's point is we need to start talking about it yeah. and figuring out what it is that we want or can do for 40,000 bucks. Yep. Okay. Yep. We should have a lot of meeting time available coming up. <laughs> right? Can you see what my schedule are you looking at, bud? Right <laughs> That's what I was thinking about this whole meeting. Like, okay, we keep talking about pushing this thing off and then this thing and then this thing. Uh, okay. Noted and yes, let's do it. Um, okay. Did that cover everything around there? Yeah. Uh, next up is the Northern Waters. Yep. Do you want me to? Go ahead. Um, so Northern Borders, we talked about Northern Borders momentarily in our project planning uh, work. Brian mentioned that um, he was gonna start working on a letter of intent and um, we quickly, we didn't even talk about it really, we quickly moved on to all things ARPA. Um, and I know that because I rewatched the session of our discussion, so I wanted to be clear about what happened. Um, in all of that, uh, the Northern Borders changed their deadline from what I understand. Uh, from talking with Brian, they changed their deadline. At, sorry, they changed the uh, letter of intent requirement and it was required this year and it hasn't been prior years and an assumption was made that it was not a requirement. So long story short, we missed the deadline to get the letter of intent in and um, will not be able to submit for application this year for the Northern Borders grant. Um, there is opportunity of following years, although there are some uh, concerns around our uh, 
likelihood to get awarded grants in the future, um, but we don't know how real they are or aren't. So that's where we stand with our northern borders, unfortunately. Uh, we were, we had talked about previously um, using some of our ARPA money as match funding uh, for some of the northern borders too. And that still could be the case if we were awarded northern, a northern borders grant next year. A possibility is my understanding. Did I miss anything? No, I would say that it's there are other development grant opportunities that are only one. But that was a big one. That was a big one. And that was a likely candidate for a good fit for it. Yep. Yep. So it's not a good news story for sure. So, Sure, this doesn't happen. We missed a couple of opportunities in the past when we brought Seth on board to supposedly chase these things and keep on top of them. Um, and yet, here we missed another one. How can we ensure that this doesn't happen the next time we're ready? I don't think I have a good answer for that. And uh, not to be disrespectful to the board or the public, but I think that would be better, a discussion better suited for a second session. Okay. Um, can you, sorry, I, I missed the Seth thing. What is, what is Seth's role? We've engaged with LCPC and with Seth in particular to provide assistance for pursuing grant opportunities for the flight Okay. 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 Uh, all right. Anything, any other questions on Northern Borders? <clears throat> Comments? I, I will be suggesting an executive session to discuss this because I think Brian is right that uh, the discussion is best had um, as an executive session item. I, I will only say that the state and I am disappointed to miss the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. We all are disappointed. It's a big opportunity. Yep. Okay, let's move on to the next item. Next item is the Frank and Giselle Eldred um, email about the uh, the Dixon property on River Road East. Thank you. I don't remember the address off the top of my head, but. Uh, so we are coordinating with our health officers to try and have a more regular presence at the property uh, to ensure cleanup. We've been coordinated. We've been working on it, coordinating with uh, state employees uh, at the DEC, um, and it is in quite a state right now. And uh, a, it is necessary for us to uh, ramp up our enforcement in the new term. Enforcement around health or uh, possibly health. health. We're going to be we're going to be considering that. Um, we have some concerns about uh, we have some concerns about the property. It might be. We can do a rental housing health inspection if no one invites us in. We can do it if any if either the, the homeowner, if either the property owner or the tenant invites us in. If no one invites us in, it becomes is limited to public health concerns, which are harder to administer. But we are given the condition of the place, we are concerned about it for a, a public health concern. Um, 
we're also pursuing the improper disposal of solid waste on the property. Um, in the past, the uh, property owners, the Armstrongs, had operated a shop uh, where they sold a lot of things. So they were buying things and staging them in their home and then taking them to their shop. And there's a lot of turnover in all that. And it was stuff that could be sold at the shop. So it was very difficult for us to consider it garbage. And that was the state's same position that it was difficult to call it garbage if it was being sold uh, at a store. But they closed their store. They're not operating a store anymore. Uh, this stuff is still on the property. It is definitely garbage now. Why do we think we'd be any more successful this time? I think we're going to run into all the same problems that we had last time. Uh, but I, I want to step this up because we do have a new property owner now. Property has changed hands. Um, yeah, so I really want to step up the enforcement so that we don't have somebody settling into the same patterns. You know, that we had a lot of trouble dealing with the Armstrongs over time. So when we got limited cooperation with them, we really pursued that limited cooperation because we thought that was a better avenue than getting stonewall. Uh, I don't want to let with a new property owner, I don't want to let it settle into that same low expectations again. I, I don't disagree. I, I just, we've been dealing with that property for a decade. And it's just very, very frustrating. It is, I mean, full honesty, it's going to be really frustrating. We're going to make slow, small, uh, we're going to make very little progress on it. You know, we're going to write a lot of fines that, you know, get thrown out. Or, you know, maybe they get paid, but yeah, it's, it's going to be slow and frustrating. I, I think I asked the question, so I'm going to offer a couple thoughts. Um, I agree with Brian that we should step up the enforcement. I also agree with Eric that we're not likely to get a lot of uh, bang for the buck on it, but I don't think it absolves us from our responsibility to at least try. Um, in a, another aspect that I think is important, um, I saw that everybody saw the videos. Um, in my mind, there's no way that that could not be considered a violation of our solid waste ordinance. Um, and we should issue fines and we should make sure those notices of violation get recorded in the land records because failure to cure a violation is a cloud on title. And if they should need to go get a bank loan or any reason get a title review, that is gonna be a major hurdle for them and it would be an impetus for them to clean it up. So that's one very small thing that we can garner out of this. Um, I don't, I totally agree with what he said about the health issues and health concerns. That's probably not an avenue that we're going to be hugely successful in. I wonder also, though, about the dilapidated building ordinance that we adopted, if that it applies here. And I also will say that I have received uh, some concerns from residents about properties on Stern Street about abandoned buildings um, and whether or not we should be pursuing those um, buildings. Sir, in the where's Stern Street? Uh, uh, Stern Street. Uh, yeah, I, I, so on um, July, a dilapidated building review, July, -ish. I don't know, I just picked a month. It was the lowest month I could find any events happening, uh, but it is on the list to, to uh, do something with. Those are pretty awful looking, agreed. They are. And I feel bad for the elders. I, I, I know they have been dealing with this for a long, long time, and I feel we owe them at least some effort, even if it even if it is gonna fail. Um, I really think we should try and do something to and it we have been 
working with the Armstrongs all along, but it's been very little progress. Uh, but yeah, this is a good opportunity to really step up our efforts and you know, put more pressure on them. Okay, we're getting really close to a meeting that's going too long. Let's, uh, so thanks for asking. Hope that helps. We'll keep plugging away. Keep asking. Uh, next up is executive discussion to um, from our attorney regarding tax appeal. The, so the town is called an ongoing tax appeal uh, involving, I think it's public record who were involved with our record. Uh, but Michael Lazar of AG Self Storage. Um, and we have some communications from our attorney about that. Right. We've got to actually make the motion if it's motion. premature public knowledge or not. But uh, my recommendation. My motion that. Second sentence. Uh, the board finds it that premature public disclosure of information regarding the tax appeal. tax appeal may substantially disadvantage the town. If that being the case, and I motion that the board enter into executive session as allowed by one BSA 313. Motion to do a second. It's a two-part motion. Right, that's good enough. That, that sounds good enough. Second. Uh, okay. Why do we need it? Okay, we don't need to. All right. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Sorry, all those opposed, ayes have it. So we are in executive session at nine.